Thank you for coming. I'm Bruce Caldwell. I'm the uh, director of the Center for the History of Political Economy, and I'd like uh, to welcome all of you to this is our first uh, event in the Hayek Lecture Series. The Hayek Lecture Series is a program that has uh, sponsors on campus. Uh, the Center for the History of Political Economy is one of them. The pp &E program that's directed by Mike Munger uh, in the second row is a, is a second uh, campus sponsor in the Duke program in American Values and Institutions, uh, directed uh, by Michael Gillespie, uh, also in the second row, is a uh, third sponsor. And uh, our outside sponsor, the person whose um, foundation makes it all possible financially, is the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. James Pearson. Uh, James Pearson earned his PhD in political science from Michigan State University and has taught at Iowa State University, Indiana University, and the University of Pennsylvania. He's the co-author of Political Tolerance and American Democracy, and more recently of uh, Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, How the Assassination of John F. Kennedy Shattered American Liberalism. He also publishes articles and reviews in numerous journals and newspapers, among them Commentary, The New Criterion, The American Political Science Review, Public Interest, Philanthropy, The American Spectator, The Wall Street Journal, The Weekly Standard, National Review, and The Washington Post, among them. From 1985 to 2005, a 20-year run, Dr. Pearson was Executive Director and Trustee of the John M. Olin Foundation. Uh, currently, he's President of the William E. Simon Foundation and a Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute in New York. Uh, Dr. Pearson serves on the boards of several other institutions uh, including the Pinkerton Foundation, the Thomas W. Smith Foundation, the one who is sponsoring this lecture, uh, the Center for Individual Rights, the Philanthropy Roundtable, the Foundation for Cultural Review, the American Spectator Foundation, the Hoover Institution, Donors Trust, the William F. Buckley Program at Yale University. I was uh, very proud to and honored to be invited to talk there last week, and the Intercollegiate uh, Studies Institute. So this evening, the topic of his talk is inequality. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Pearson. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, I'm delighted to be at Duke University again with uh, many old friends. Uh, our subject tonight is inequality, and uh, that's a a very hot topic this year with the publication of the Piketty book. So uh, let, me, let me go through this subject, and uh, many of you will be familiar with some of the things I'm, I have to say, but other things are somewhat unconventional, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> my general view is that inequality is real. It has been growing in wealth and income since the early 1980s. I don't dispute those facts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's an issue that I think is being manipulated by some for political purposes. Uh, remedies for it are being set forth that are probably uh, that are likely to be unconstructive. And thirdly, I think that the inequality we see is very uh, closely tied into the regime of political economy that we built since 1980, and it cannot be easily teased out of that regime without taking the regime down. And let me get to that last point later at the end of the talk, because <clears throat> I think it's a very important one. So uh, we've been through many crises in the United States over the last many decades. We had a poverty crisis in the 1960s, followed by an urban crisis in the late 1960s. Who can forget the energy crisis in the 1970s, followed by the homeless crisis in the 1980s, and the Clintons brought us the health care crisis. And then more recently, we've had the global warming and climate change crisis, and now the inequality crisis. We seem to, uh, in American politics, we seem to talk in terms of crisis. Uh, I'm not sure that any of these crises have yielded constructive solutions. Uh, many people like to talk about these subjects in terms of crisis in order to stampede the public into doing things they might not otherwise do. Uh, under calm and deliberate judgment. 
So the inequality crisis, we've had a number of books published in, the recent, in recent years about inequality. It's different now than it was in the past. In the past, when we talked about inequality, we talked about bringing the poor up into the middle class. Thus, the poverty crisis and the poverty programs of the 1960s. This is different. Now we're talking about the problems of the, not the problem, but the issue of the 1%. We're talking about the rich and trying to find a way to redistribute the income of the rich back through the population. So we're no longer talking about the poor. We're talking about the other end of the political spectrum. Now, just in general, I, th I think it's unlikely that we can improve the living standards of the 99% in America by redistributing income downward from the 1%. Uh, but that's a somewhat different issue. So this is really the new inequality that we're talking about. Now, of course, this does run counter to the American grain. Tocqueville talked about equality of condition in America in the 1830s as being fundamental to the idea of equality in America. The founding fathers, in general, uh, who wrote and signed the Declaration of Independence, tended to be more of an aristocratic vein who laid down the principle of equality, but American culture changed very rapidly in the early parts of the 19th century as the country moved westward. So that the development of inequality in the 20th century seemed to run against uh, the grain of what happened in the 19th century. Uh, so. This issue gained a lot of steam earlier in the year with the publication of Thomas Piketty's book, A Capital in the 21st Century. Some of you have read it. Uh, others have picked it up and put it back down. I would have brought it here with me this evening, but it was too heavy to put in my carry-on luggage. Uh, but it's a serious book, <coughs> uh, an important book. Uh, a great deal of work has gone into it. And, uh, you know, I recommend it for anyone who's really interested in this subject. This is the best statement of the redistributionist thesis that we have. In some ways, a little bit like Marx, who took the issue of the factory system in the 19th century and put it into the framework of a broad historical theory, <clears throat> and maybe a little bit like Keynes, who took the whole question of public spending and public work spending and put it in the context of a broader theory of economics, Piketty has taken the, issue, taken the issue of inequality and placed it into a grand historical theory of capitalism. Is that theory valid? I don't really think so, but it's certainly worth parsing and thinking about. <clears throat> now, he's done, I think, three general things in this book that are important. One, he and his colleagues have put together an impressive array of data on the distribution of wealth and income, not only in the United States, but in Great Britain, France, Japan, uh, a few other Western countries, going back to the late 19th century. And in France, they've taken some of this data back to the early parts of the 1800s, wealth and income. And they've been working at this for many, many years. And uh, what they've come up with uh, is very interesting and important in terms of the accumulation of all this data. Now, secondly, there is the theory that he've, he's, they, they have placed this data into. And basically, their theory is that inequality is a fundamental aspect of capitalism. And unless the government in some way sits on the capitalist system via redistributive taxation and regulation, inequality uh, will uh, go beyond acceptable bounds, as they think it has gone in the last few decades. Then, of course, there's the remedy, which is uh, taxes, redistributive taxes, basically. So <clears throat> why don't we look at some of this data, quote unquote, the information uh, on this. It's, as I say, it's, it's quite interesting. The inequality that we see around us today is somewhat new, uh, and it's different 
from what it was at the turn of the century. So here we have this table uh, which somewhat summarizes their thesis. And here are they. I've taken this from an article that Piketty wrote with uh, his colleague Emmanuel Sayes of the uh, University of California at Berkeley. And uh, this is their chart of uh, the rate of return on capital and the growth of output in the world economy since, well, we're taking it back to the year zero. I don't think they have any idea what these numbers were a thousand years ago, but it's their guess. So the basic theory is that the return on capital, uh, capital being stocks, factory, machinery, inputs into the production process, but not only that, uh, that grows faster typically than output in the economy. And output in the economy, they take to be something of a surrogate for wages and salaries. So wages and salaries grow at the rate, generally, of the output in the economy. Capital grows at a different rate. So they think that throughout history, capital has grown faster than the output in the economy. So they think that long-term output is about 1.5% a year, and it can't get very much more than that. But the one thing I want to point out is look at the, the middle decades of the 20th century where that red arrow, pure return, pure rate of return on capital dives and then goes back up again. And the blue line, the growth rate of world output, goes up very rapidly. Okay, that's very important to their thesis. That's basically the middle part of the 20th century which they think is a kind of an outlier in the historical development of the world economy. So that roughly, you know, it's uh, roughly from 1930 to 1980, maybe a little bit before going back to World War I, the output in the economy somewhat outpaced returns on capital and we had a more egalitarian system. And since 1980, it's gone the other way and we've had a rise in inequality, which takes us back to the kinds of inequality of wealth and income that we had in the 19th century and for generations before that. That's basically our thesis. Now, I don't think that's a valid historical argument for a lot of reasons, which I won't go into here, because for the simple reason that they think that it's a bad thing that the rate of return on capital uh, grows more quickly than output in the economy, but when we get a high returns on capital, we get more investment in machinery, uh, productivity enhancing uh, kinds of investments, which improve output, uh, uh, improve labor productivity, and improve wealth. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said, and I think correctly, that the accumulation of capital is one measure of progress in a society. That's what we want. So we want those returns on capital to generate more investment, more, pro more productivity, more progress in society. So uh, I don't want to go into this in, in great detail, but that's basically the theory. I think it's somewhat flawed. Another flaw that I would point out is, of course, that they, they judge the whole capitalist enterprise in terms of uh, the distribution of income and wealth when there are a lot of other things that we need to consider. Freedom, innovation, uh, growth and wealth, living standards, uh, that sort of thing. So th that's, their, that's their theory. So what we get out of this, and I'm gonna return to this, is that we get this historical interpretation, which is that before about 1930, the Great Depression, maybe take it back to World War I in Europe. Before that, we have a kind of, a, of a economic system which generates inequality. In between that period, from roughly 1930 to 1980, we have an age in which there's much more equality in these economies. And then beginning in 1980, we have a kind of a reversal. Uh, that's the case he makes. So let's just look at some of this data just very quickly so you can 
uh, just see what we're talking about. This chart shows you the average before tax income growth of uh, the bottom 99% and the top 1%. That's the green line. So, you know, if we take it out to about 2007 on that green line where it reaches a peak, so from 1979 to 2007, the top 1% uh, income increased by about 200 and 70%, 2.7 times, whereas the bottom 99% increased by about 45%. So uh, a lot of the returns to economic growth in this period went to the various well, very, the, the wealthiest groups. Now this is income before tax income. Uh, and the blue line is the adjusted median income of the uh, economy as a whole, which over that uh, roughly 30-year uh, period uh, grew also by about 45 percent. So this is why I say, this, uh, this is a CBO, Congressional Budget Office data, this is why I say that, uh, you know, the facts do support this idea. This is after average after-tax income, again, CBO data. And there is a mildly redistributed, redistributive aspect to this, though you wouldn't see it in this. This looks pretty much like the other graph I showed you. This is after-tax income. So the federal tax system doesn't really redistribute income all that much as it is today. This is just the, uh, uh, the so-called Gini index, before tax, after tax, uh, over that period of time, which just tells you what I just told you. Uh, that's a measure of equality of income. Just another way of cutting this, here's uh, 1979 to 2010, again, CBO data. The shares of income, pre-tax household income of the different groups. So, that top line is the top 20%. So in 2007, they had about 55% of the total income of the economy. 2010, the total income in the economy was about $11 trillion. Uh, the top 20% therefore had about uh, close to $6 trillion of that. Red line is the top 10%. 40% and the bottom line is the top 1%. So uh, I said that the total income in the U.S. economy in 2010 was about $11 trillion. The top 1% had about 1 1.5 to 1.6 trillion of that. Uh, so as you see, this is trending upward from 1979 to the present for those top income brackets. One thing we need to bear in mind as we look at these data is that there is movement in these groups. The people who were in the top 1% or 10% or 20% in 1979 may not have been the same people and probably were not the same people who were there in 1990, 2000, 2010. A lot of mixing in that. So these are not the same people. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this takes us back really almost to the turn of the century. This takes us really through the 20th century. This is from uh, Emmanuel Saez. This is one of Piketty's colleagues. This is a share of pre tax, pre transfer income for the top 1% from 1913 to 2012. So the uh, top two lines are without capital gains. No, uh, the top line is uh, top 1% with capital gains, and that bottom purple line is the top 1% without capital gains. Basically, they tell you the same picture, which, is, which displays somewhat their historical argument. 
of pre-1930, 1930 to 1980, post-1980, these three periods of modern economic history. So what do we have? We have, I guess the point here is that if you look at that blue line, which is the top 1% with capital gains, uh, that group in, 19, in the 1920s had something approaching 25% of pre-tax, pre-transfer income. We go to 2003, 2005, 2007, that's roughly where it is back. And in those middle decades, it's down around 10%. So you have this U-shaped curve in the distribution of income through the 20th century. If we move from income to wealth, bear in mind these are really different things. Uh, governments tax income, at least our government does, they don't tax wealth. Uh, wealth, stocks, bonds, real estate, other kinds of possessions. Uh, so this is the top 1% and the top one-tenth of 1%. So just to give you an idea here that in, not, in 2010, there are about 120 million households reporting taxes. In the top 1%, then, there would be about 1.2 million households. And in the top 0.1%, we're talking about 120,000 households. So this a little bit uh, reinforces the U-shaped curve, not, not quite as drastically. You see that it goes down. Uh, top 1% has about 45% of the total wealth in the early part of the 20th century. And it dives in the middle part of the century and creeps back up to somewhere around 35% today. And the top 1 tenth of 1%, we're talking 25% early in the century, dives, then gradually goes back up. Well, what's the total wealth in the American economy today? That's a good question. Um, there's about 80 to 90 trillion dollars of household wealth in the U.S. economy. The capitalization of the U.S. stock market today is about 21 trillion dollars on GDP of about 17 trillion. The bond market is about 40 to 45 trillion and residential real estate makes up most of the rest. So, you know, if we just take this in terms of $2,010, that would mean that the top 0.1% had 15% of that $80 trillion, which is, do the math for me, about maybe $12 trillion. Is that about right? And the top 1% would have somewhere around $25 trillion of that. I'm not sure anybody can make any sense out of those numbers. They're very large, obviously, but <clears throat> that is not, that, so in other words, the concentration of wealth is somewhat greater than the concentration of, of income. Uh, I don't want to go into this chart. This is a, a chart the IRS calculated in terms of uh, mobility between two, 1994 96 and 2005, what they did was they took, uh, uh, they traced the people who filed income tax returns in 1996 and 2005 and traced where they were in 96 and compared what quintile they were in in 2005. I don't want to go into this because it's a complicated chart. But anyway, uh, if you go down the diagonal, starting with 42.4, those are the people, that's the percentages who stayed in the same quintile. If you go below that, those are the people who are downwardly mobile, who went from a higher quintile to a lower quintile in those nine years. And the red, red numbers above the diagonal are the percentages who moved up. So we have, uh, and you have to read these across. So. If you take the lowest quintile in 1996, 42% stayed where they were over the nine years. Then you move across, 3% three, three went from the lowest quintile to the highest quintile. Uh, I don't know what to make of those numbers other than to say that there is some mobility. That the, 
the numbers above the diagonal are quite a bit higher than the numbers below the diagonal. So that means people are moving up uh, from quintile to quintile. We don't, we don't have a rigid system in America where people don't move around. These are just some summary numbers for you. This is what in 2010 dollars, what it would take uh, in terms of means to be in these different groups. Top 1% average, 1.3 million, move down. And household net worth, that's real estate, stocks, bonds, pensions, uh, top 1%, 16 million. And of course, you move down to the bottom, 40%. They don't have a lot of uh, assets, which that's something that we already know. Now, <clears throat> we'll come back to this, but these are shares of individual income tax liabilities of the different groups. So one of the ideas that Piketty has is that you can redistribute this income in the interest of equality. But as you see from 1979 to 2010, we shifted the tax burden upward significantly uh, through the income bracket. So in, if you look at that top line, that's the top quintile, the top 20% of income earners. They, had, uh, they paid about 65% of the income taxes in 1979, and they're paying 93% by 2010. The top 1% in 1980 paid 17% of the total income taxes, and they paid in 2010 39%. Uh, so the top 20% basically pays our income taxes. Uh, and we've taken the rest of the income quintiles off the income tax system. So uh, a couple of points I'd make here. Uh, which is that we reduced, in those years, we reduced the marginal tax rate in the United States from 70 percent, where it was in 1979. Uh, Reagan reduced it to 50 percent in 1981, and then it went down to 28 percent in 1986, and then in the Clinton years it moved up to 39 percent back to 35% in the Bush years, now back up to 39%. And the top 1% is paying 44%, the extra increment, increment to pay for Obamacare. So as we reduced the marginal tax rates, the tax uh, burden on the wealthier groups increased. Uh, that was to some extent a trade-off to get the, the rates reduced, the burden was shifted, and they took the lower income groups more or less out of the income tax system. Now they do pay payroll taxes, uh, Social Security tax, Medicare tax, uh, all wage earners do. So that, that has not changed. But uh, the point is that you know, that's pretty significant, I think, that the top 20 percent pay 93 percent. They don't have 93 percent of the income. Uh, the top 1% pays 39%, and in 2010, they had 14% of the income. You could raise the question, you know, uh, how much more of this can we do if we're talking about redistribution? Okay, here we go back to our U-shaped curve uh, through the century. This is the top one-tenth of 1%. One that is, in 2010, 100,000 households. Obviously, it's a lower number as we go back in time. And this is where they get their income. So uh, in the early part of the century, uh, the really wealthy got their income from capital, stocks and bonds, ownership of businesses. That makes perfect sense. And the, one of the points that Piketty and his colleagues make is that has changed. Now, of course, uh, you do get this. Uh, this is the, the, share, the, the, the top one-tenth of one percent uh, share of total income. So, so it's high in the early part of the century. It dives and it goes back up again. But the key, one of the key points is that the wealthy income groups are making much more of their money today in salaries 
than they did in the early part of the century. In other words, the nature of the wealthy groups has changed. They're no longer owners of stocks and bonds and businesses. They're salaried workers. They're people who work for salaries and, and earn high salaries. So as you look over to the right side of that chart, you'll see that salary income, which is that the top segment, uh, has increased dramatically as a share of the income of the top uh, one-tenth of one percent. And this is a point that, that Piketty emphasizes, and I wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal earlier in the year when some, uh, uh, when the columnist for the New York Times uh, wrote a column titled, I think he called it, The Lazy Rich. He was playing off, playing this off against the claim that some people make that the poor are lazy, but he wanted to talk about the idle and the lazy rich. So I was able to point out, even using this, this data, that the wealthy work for a living. These are people who work for a living, and a lot of them work a uh, very challenging job. So this is something that's, that's quite different. And it, it somewhat challenges the narrative of who the wealthy are in American society. But again, I'd emphasize here, you see that U-shaped pattern, which I'm going to come back to. OK, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So I'll just leave that chart up there. So, uh, so Piketty and his colleagues say this is a terrible problem that we have <clears throat> because Inequality has been increasing in wealth and income, and this kind of contradicts the promise, really, of American life and also life in other democracies that income should be spread out. It also challenges the idea that many people had in the 1950s about the evolution of the capitalist system. So in the 19th century, there was a dominant theory, Marx, of course, uh, David Ricardo, they tended to claim that as the capitalist process continued, that there'd be a greater concentration of wealth and fewer and fewer hands. That was the dominant idea through the 19th century. Uh, and of course, Marx predicted that this would cause a revolution. In the 1950s, an American economist by the name of Simon Kuznets uh, did some research, and he showed that inequality was declining. And so he was pointing to some of this data here, as you look at this chart, or some of the other charts uh, from the early part of the century. Do I have this? I guess, yeah, here we go. Uh, that in the early part of the century, inequality was declining. Uh, so Piketty and his colleagues are now challenging this because this process has been reversed. And he kind of comes down on the side of Marx and some of the other writers of the 19th century who suggest, no, it's in the nature of the capitalist process that inequality increases unless government intervenes to stop it. Uh, so uh, what, do we, what do we do about this? Well, he suggests two things. One, obviously, uh, you have to raise income taxes. He thinks that you could raise income taxes from where they are today in America to about 60%. It's a marginal tax rate now, say for the top 1%, with Obamacare is around 43 or 44%. He thinks you could increase that to 60% on people earning between 200 and $500,000 a year. Now, in 2010, it took about $300,000 of taxable income to be in the top 1%. So he would raise that tax. And on anybody making over $500,000 a year in income, he'd raise the marginal tax rate to 80%. Uh, and he thinks, he thinks one thing, you can redistribute the income through the government. He also has a different idea, which is that he thinks that high salaries are being paid today because the tax rates were reduced in the 1980s. He thinks that the reduction in tax rates, the highest tax rates, created a permissive environment to pay people high salaries uh, so that the president of Duke University can make a million dollars a year when before that it was culturally impermissible to pay people that kind of money. 
He also thinks that a board, in setting the salary of an executive, either in a business or in a not-for-profit institution like Duke, will say, what's the point of giving this executive a high raise if 80% of that increment is going to go to the government? So that money won't be paid. So they think a high tax rate is a deterrent in and of itself to paying these high salaries. Now, uh, I don't know if they're right or wrong about that. Uh, they also think that these high salaries are being paid not on the basis of productivity and contribution to the economy, but because executives game the system. They belong to the same club as the directors who are setting their salaries. In some cases, they set their own salaries. Uh, so that's their explanation for it. I've seen some research on this that suggests that's not really true, that, uh, that the game, the system, is not exactly accurate. Uh, now, you could ask yourself the question, would redistribution work? You know, I have a, a lot of doubts about that. Uh, first of all, sending money to Washington. Five of the six richest counties in the United States surround Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. has one of the highest per capita incomes in the country. It's, uh, it's true of the, of the counties surrounding Washington. You have to have, to get into the top 1% of the income distribution in Washington, D.C., you have to high, have a far higher income than in any other region or city in the whole country. To get in the top 1% in Washington, D.C., you need to make $700,000 a year. In Connecticut, it's closer to 600000 In Arkansas, it's about 250000 So Washington is a fairly wealthy place. <clears throat> Why do we want to send money there in the interest of equality? Uh, it, uh, it looks like a situation in which you're sending money to a very wealthy place, they'll charge a rent as they circulate it, and they're taking in, of course, 20 to 25 percent of the nation's GDP every year, and then they're going to recycle it back out. And will it get to anybody who needs it? That seems to me to be highly unlikely. So I don't think, uh, in my judgment, I don't think the redistribution argument works all that well. Um, <clears throat> You can take the money, you can tax the money, but it's not clear to me that it's going to improve the equality situation all that much. Besides which, you're only getting at people who earn high incomes. What about the whole wealth issue? You can get at the people of those salaries, but somebody who's making a good salary, working a tough job like being president of a university, uh, you know, what's the, what, what are we gaining by doing that? <clears throat> So they also recommend a wealth tax. That would be a tax on stocks, bonds, and real estate to get at wealth. Now, they focus a lot on the European Union to do this. They're not so much on the United States for a reason I'll talk about momentarily. So wealth taxes are difficult to implement, all right? So for a lot of reasons. Uh, it spurs capital flight. People take their capital out of the country and take it someplace else where there's no tax. It's often difficult to value capital. Uh, for example, what about people who own businesses? How do you value those businesses if you're going to impose a wealth tax on them? Uh, and of course, as I said, it creates arguments about the valuation. Plus, if you own stocks and bonds, the value of those instruments can plummet the day after you file your taxes. Those are very volatile because of the way the markets work. So a lot of countries have adopted wealth taxes and given them up. France has a wealth tax of about 1.5 percent graduated upward, reaching a peak on incomes of about $10 million or more, uh, denominated in euros. Uh, Switzerland, I think, has one. Several European countries have had them and discontinued them for that reason. Now, would a wealth tax be constitutional in the United States? That's a good question. I don't think so, uh, for this reason. The original Constitution said that Congress can lay taxes, but they have to be apportioned equally among the states by population. 
In the 1890s, Congress passed an income tax that was not apportioned. Because you can't really apportion an income tax really very easily. And the Supreme Court knocked it out. And a lot of people, mostly Democrats, uh, wanted to get rid, uh, wanted to have an income tax because they wanted to get rid of the tariff as the source of income for the federal government, and which was the case at that time. So an income tax seemed to be an alternative. And we did pass the 16th Amendment, but the 16th Amendment says that Congress shall have the power to lay taxes on incomes without regard to apportionment among the states. So that doesn't seem to me to be allow room, uh, allow room for a wealth tax in the United States unless you amended the Constitution which is one of the reasons that they uh, focus much more on Europe. And of course, you would need an integrated banking system internationally uh, regulated so that all banks would report transactions and assets to national treasuries so that such a tax could be uh, regulated and imposed. So what's the cause then of this rise in inequality? that we've seen in the last 30 odd years? Is it endemic to the capitalist system or is something else going on? Now their argument is one, it's caused by a reduction in taxes and they claim that you see it more in the countries where taxes were reduced, the United States and Great Britain primarily, less in some of these other countries and they think the wealthy are gaming the system. Now a lot of economists have looked at this and they point to a couple of other factors. Uh, one would be the integration of technology, uh, globalization, and education. When you throw those three things together, that, that tends to uh, give great benefits to people who are technically skilled and well-educated. So that in many of these areas, people, especially with a global marketplace, and with the kind of technology we have, they can spread their skills over wider markets and get greater returns. And this is one of the things that uh, contributes to the widening gap and the, the gains that the tw top 20% or 10% or 1% have gained at the expense of the rest. And of course, when you throw China and India, which is about 3 billion people into the world economy as we've done over the last 30 years, and we globalize our markets as the United States has, has uh, tried to encourage, that puts a lot of American workers into a competitive environment that they were not in before. So you've got that constellation of factors going on. I would add uh, one, other thing, one other aspect on top of that, and I think that latter is a valid argument which the economists are making. And that's the stock market. And that's, we get back to this, <clears throat> this chart. So what I've done in this chart is I have indexed everything to the year 1957. So the green line is the top 1% share of national income. This is data that Sayez and Piketty have supplied. And those, that red line and blue line again set at zero in 1957 is the movement of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500. Uh, <clears throat> so that you can see that those lines kind of move pretty much in tandem from 1957 down to the present. They go up. They're pretty flat there up until about 1980. They start to trend upward in common in the 1980s. They, when, we have a, when we have a stock market crash, it goes down. The stock market rebounds, they go up. They go up and down together. Now, these two things are very highly correlated, the stock market and the income and wealth of the wealthy. Because after all, who owns stocks and bonds in America? Uh, <clears throat> so. These two things are correlated. The, the, to, the top 1% share is correlated about 0.95% with the 
with the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P, a very high correlation. Now, that may not be causal for you statisticians, and I'm not asserting that it is, but I'm saying these two things are very closely related, that the stock market is a big factor here, uh, in both in income and in wealth. So that we could solve the inequality problem tomorrow. Maybe we will. We could do it like we did it in the 1930s. We could throw up tariff barriers around the U.S. economy, and we could crash the stock market, and that would take care of it tomorrow. Uh, we, 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 if that happened, we wouldn't be talking about inequality. So, and let me get to this point a little bit, which is that, therefore, this inequality that we talk about is somewhat embedded in larger factors that are, that are that's difficult to get at with the typical instruments of, say, redistributive taxation. Now, we could ask ourselves the question, and let me come back to this, why did the stock market take off in 1980, 81, 82, and go on a 30-year rampage uh, of a kind that's unprecedented in the history of the capitalist order? We've never seen anything like it. The 1920s bull market lasted about five years. This has lasted 30 plus years. Did it end in 2008 and is it on life support today because of the policies of the Fed? Maybe. We'll find that out later. Uh, and I want to come back to that. And I think that's important in terms of understanding the era that we're now living in. Uh, and I have some suggestions on that. Maybe some people here have some explanations for it. But that's key. Why did the, why did the stock market stay flat in real terms for 50 years? In 1980, the stock market in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms, was no higher than it was in 1929. And then why did it take off in this way? So let's go back then to this historical theory that's implied in the Piketty volume. So his argument is that the prosperity of the modern period is false prosperity. It's prosperity that has flowed very disproportionately to the very wealthy, <coughs> leaving just about everybody else worse off or no better off. Phony prosperity. And this takes us into his three-part division of modern history. So we have three periods, roughly running from 1870 to 1914 in Europe, and 1870 to the Great Depression, 1929 in America. Uh, we have, that's the original gilded age. Gilded, not golden. Gilded age of phony prosperity. This is their theory. Then we have a golden age of social democracy, as we call it, from 1930 to 1980, well, of very high taxes um, and a more equal distribution of income and wealth. And then we have the new gilded age commencing in 1980 and running down to the present. That's their theory. Well, uh, is that valid? Well, I take this up a, a somewhat in this pamphlet that I've written. So uh, the capitalist order is not all that old. I think we can date the capitalist order to about 1770. Why? That was when the factory system was first invented for the uh, manufacture of textiles. Somebody in England invented these big water wheels to spin textiles. So what you had was a cottage industry turned into a factory system. We always had markets. Uh, we always had private property. We always had trade going back to the ancient world. What we didn't have was systemic innovation of the kind that starts in that period, and which builds uh, and leads to more innovations the steam engine, the railroad, electricity, and so on. So we're now talking about 
this more modern period from 1870 to the present. In Europe, it's dated from the unification of Germany and America, I guess, to the end of the Civil War. Now, John Maynard Keynes, looking at that period before World War I, said that um, uh, what a golden age uh, of, of Europe came to an end on August 1st, 1914. And he, taught, he marveled at the prosperity that was created across Europe between 1870 and 1914. Uh, and uh, about all the innovations that were created, electricity, mass-produced steel, uh, the internal combustion engine, uh, automobiles, uh, and all sorts of spin-offs from all that, radios, telegraphs, all that, uh, which uh, promoted world trade and the expansion of wealth for everyone. Uh, also, uh, millions of people uh, came from Europe into the United States in search of high real wages in the American economy at the time to build railroads and factories. And these are three aspects of what I would call golden ages in history. One, widening circles of trade. Um, two, innovation. And uh, uh, the third one is uh, widening circles of trade, uh, innovation, and, uh, well, rapid, rapid economic growth. And, of course, immigration into centers of wealth. So this period, which was destroyed and brought to an end by World War I in Europe, by the Great Depression in Europe, was really a, a, an age of tremendous progress. So then in between, we have this golden age of social democracy, and nobody should gainsay the progress that we made between, say, 1930 with the New Deal and going out to 1980. However, it was a period in which uh, we grew from a very low base. All sorts of capital was wiped out in World War I and World War II. The Great Depression wiped out capital. Uh, it was a period of uh, concentration of American industry. Uh, unions were very strong, but partly because they were bargaining with oligopolies in steel, autos, railroads, aluminum other industries. Uh, many people thought that the concentration of industry in the United States impeded innovation. And a lot of the growth in that period was based upon the building out of innovations from a previous period. Automobiles, highways, uh, applications of electricity, not a lot of other innovation. And of course, the United States prospered because the rest of the world was flat on their back after World War II, and that was going to be a temporary situation. So that was their golden age has much to speak for it, but there are a lot of weaknesses. And of course, we didn't have a global economic system at the time. We didn't have, we had the Cold War. Russia, the Soviet Union was out of the world economy. So was China, India, a lot of third world places were outside the world economy. So what happens in this period from 1980 onward? So we ha do have widening, we have globalization, widening circles of trade, tremendous innovation, which we know of, uh, of a new kind, the microprocessor, the computer, the internet, the cell phone, all the applications which float from this, uh, which have made uh, uh, people's lives easier, better. Uh, some people have gotten rich from them but they've not done that by exploiting anybody, but by creating new products, investing in new things. It's been a period of rapid uh, immigration to centers of wealth. Um, and I would argue that this has really been a period of uh, great progress in, in the global economy. It's been a kind of a go uh, golden age. Now you could ask yourself the question, well, why did this golden age of social democracy, what happened to it? Uh, did the rich dismantle it? Nothing could be further from the truth. In the 1970s, the whole thing collapsed. We had combined high inflation and high unemployment. Uh, the leaders of both political parties in the United States, also in Great Britain, thought that we had a shortage of capital, shortage of investment. That was one of the problems. We needed to adjust the tax code to encourage people 
uh, to invest. Jimmy Carter led the drive to deregulate uh, many of our major industries. And both parties agreed that we ought to be cutting taxes. Bill Bradley on the Democratic side and Ronald Reagan on the Republican side. It was a bipartisan agreement that the New Deal system had come to a dead end and we needed to do something different. And it, we've uh, generated uh, this tremendous wealth and progress since then with some cause. Well, uh, so let's go back to that, those two questions. One, if inequality is not our problem, what is? And two, that other question, what ignited the stock market rally in, 19, in the early 1980s and which accounts for this, what I would call a golden age, this new regime of political economy that we constructed in the 1980s? Uh, wrong way. Um, this is, I've, I've covered this, this is the uh, distribution of U.S. stock bond and mutual fund ownership among the different groups. Obviously the top 1% own most of our stocks and bonds, so what did I say? Stock and bond markets are $60 trillion today. Well, 50%, that's, you know, 30, 30 trillion that they own. All right, well this here, we, it gets to what is our problem? Uh, if it's not inequality, what is it? Well, I think it's the slowing growth of the American economy, which also applies to the situation in other countries as well. Japan, certainly. European countries as well. So this is the annual average real GDP growth from 1950 to 2011. And we kind of get this, this gradual uh, downward slope in line. Uh, which it becomes more evident after about 1998. Uh, this is in percentage terms. See, our great growth was in the 1950s and 1960s, as you can see, five, six percent annual growth we were getting. That was the time when we built out all of our social welfare programs. But let me give you another look at this, which is a little bit more dramatic. Okay, so this is, I've, I've put this in terms of five-year moving averages, averages to get rid of the year-to-year -year noise. So these are five-year moving averages of real GDP growth from 1950 down to the present. So there you can see the thing really does peak out in the early 60s. Dives there through the 70s. We get another, another spurt in the 80s. Recession in the early 90s. Another spurt in the Clinton years. And then it's pretty much from 2000, it's really down. So that we're in the 2000s, we're getting GP, GDP growth of around two, two and a half percent a year, when in the 90s it was above 3%. You go back to the 60s, it's five, six percent. So we get that, we get a significant slowdown. Let me just give you one more, one more cut at it. That's real GDP per capita growth with the five-year moving averages. So that's adjusted for population. So really, you really see a nice downward sloping line there going back to the 50s and 60s. So really, I think you could say, I would say, suggest that the financial collapse in 2008 was somewhat caused by the slow growth that we had beginning coming out of the 2000 recession. Why would that be? Well, in order to maintain their standard of living, people had to borrow. And they borrowed throughout the economy, aided by very low interest rates. And that growth, that, that borrowing to sustain lifestyles and standard of living created a kind of a bubble in the credit markets, which blew apart in 2008. But my point would be that the problems didn't begin in 2008. It can at least be traced back to 2000 and maybe structurally back, going back further. So I think this is, this is the real problem uh, in America, the, slow, the slowing growth of the U.S. economy so that uh, the the middle classes and the working classes, people who work for average incomes, it's harder and harder for them to get ahead in a slowing economy. 
uh, and if we want to improve their fortunes, we're not going to be able to do it by attacking the one percent. We have to grow, find a way to grow the economy. Now, there are a lot of arguments as to why these these sorts of things are happening, uh, and I could go into them, but it's somewhat beyond the scope. But I would say that growth is our issue. Now, let's go back to this question of the stock market. Why did the stock market take off? Um, there, that chart there uh, gives you the, the, the capitalization of the U.S. stock market as a percentage of nominal GDP. You know, really the only point I would make there is you can see that up until about 1980, the capitalization of the stock market is generally less than GDP. And beginning in that period, it rises above GDP. That's just an indicator. But here is another one. So this is total credit market debt owed in the U.S. economy. That's consumer debt, government debt, agency debt, corporate debt, all accumulated uh, in relation to U.S. GDP. So credit market debt is that blue line. U.S. Uh, GDP is the red line. So these things, up until about 1980, grow pretty much in tandem. And then outstanding credit market debt takes off in about 1980 uh, and is now approaching $60 trillion in total debt. U.S. government debt is about 15 or 16 trillion of that. Uh, agency debt, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, others, I think it's about 10 trillion of it. The rest of it is state and local government debt, corporate debt, and consumer debt. So we have something like 60 trillion dollars of outstanding debt in the U.S. economy on a GDP of around 16 or 17 trillion. In other words, three and a half times. This is somewhat unprecedented as it suggests. Something happened around 1980. Uh, now, one thing I think you can see is that this li these lines also more or less work in tandem with the stock market. So the stock market also begins to take off right at the same time. So somehow uh, a lot of this debt in, is, uh, leads to spending and it gets into the stock market also. So I think those two things are related, the takeoff in the stock market and the debt. Uh, but there are a lot of, lot of questions here, though. Uh, so why did this happen? Why did the debt take off at that time, which it helped to ignite the stock market rally? Uh, now, Piketty would say we reduce taxes. I, I don't think that's a good explanation for this phenomenon. I don't have a good explanation, except that I would say something like this um, in terms of the – and one thing you have to remember about the stock market is that these corporate stocks, corporations are increasingly making their money overseas. It's partly a phenomenon of globalization. A lot of this investment is overseas, and they're making money. That's propelling the stocks, but people who work in America have to earn their incomes here. That's one of the reasons for the disparity between the stock market and the incomes of working Americans. I would, I, I think that the collapse of the Bretton Woods system probably has something to do with this. So that until 1971, the United States is on an implied gold standard. The dollar is pegged to gold. Other currencies are pegged to the dollar. Uh, the run on the dollar in 1971 forced the United States finally off the gold standard, but the gold standard tended to, to constrain credit because banks, financial institutions could only issue credit against reserves that they held in gold or foreign currencies. So the collapse of the Bretton Woods system tended to liberate the whole credit and debt system uh, from the gold reserve system. Uh, I don't know if that's a complete explanation. I think it's, it's one of the explanations for this very strange 
and but I think important phenomenon which is somewhat behind all this globalization I think is also related to it so what what has happened here then in the last 30 years which has created this situation so we've had globalization we've had tremendous innovation we've had a liberation of the debt market from the gold standard which is a lot we've had we've had a stock market going straight north and of course we've had inequality uh, but I think this inequality is embedded in this in all these other factors I'm talking about and that you can't just pull it out so Piketty and his colleagues talk about capitalism in terms simply of the returns to capital in relation to labor and the distribution of wealth and income through the society okay but I think that's a kind of a one-eyed understanding of the capitalist order all these other things that we're talking about are critically important as well innovation education the credit market the stock market uh, all these things are important factors so uh, I would say that uh, uh, we've lived through a golden age in America over the last 30 years you young people are very lucky to have lived through it I think uh, John Maynard Keynes said that in a boom we need to keep the boom going we don't want to bring it to an end out of a misguided idea that we need to punish people who may have benefited from it. We want to keep it going and widen the sphere of prosperity. I think this golden age will end. All of these ages have ended. The one thing that we see as we look past into history is that the capitalist order seems to move forward in chapters, punctuated by breaks of various kinds not necessarily the same kinds of breaks the original golden age in Europe was brought to an end by a completely uh, foolish war in 1914 in the United States it was brought to an end by the stock market crash in 1929 which probably in many ways can be traced back to World War One and then in the 1970s that second chapter ended for a whole host of different reasons in a much different way. It didn't end with a bang, as those early chapters did, but more of a whimper. What do we have in store for us? What's likely to happen to bring this thing to an end? I hope we can keep it going. The Federal Reserve is obviously doing its utmost to keep it going. But I would say that whenever the stock market goes, that's what I'd look for. Whenever the stock market goes, that will be the end of the era that we're living in. And we'll have to reorganize our, our political economy, probably have to adjust to a somewhat lower standard of living, maybe, maybe not. And we'll have to find a new way forward, uh, just like we've done in the past. Uh, in the 1850s and 1860s, the 1930s and 1940s, and the 1970s. We'll have to find a new way forward. Failing that, well, you've got a grim scenario of watching our country disintegrate as a high-functioning nation-state and world superpower. So that would be where I am, which is that inequality is embedded in this other situation. There are many positive aspects of the system that we're living in. Uh, our challenge really is growth and keeping this economy going and not doing anything stupid to bring it to an end. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. about five minutes uh, for questions. I'll just let you... Uh, well, sorry I went on for so long, but uh, yeah, uh, over here. Jim, Jim, I wonder whether or not if we looked at this at a somewhat larger horizon within the development of the global economy, we wouldn't see that the, globe, the growth of the global economy has not been in the top quintile. It's mostly been in the middle quintiles. And when we look at that and we look at where people are making money, there are certainly a lot of Americans are who have money are investing it in the third world and in the in the developing world and making lots of money there. So I wonder whether or not that that doesn't explain one of the things that's happening in the growth in income differentials, which is people that have access and knowledge to do that are making a lot of money in that in the growing part of the economy, whereas our economy
economy is somewhat more stagnant and people who can't invest in that are yeah. going to make more. Well, no question that's true. Uh, all these uh, financial markets can now invest everywhere. Uh, and they do. Uh, and that's certainly a factor. One other thing I would add to it is that while inequality is growing, I'm not sure that's the best way to put it, in the United States, around the world there's greater equality because more and more people are being brought into our economic system. We've, uh, we've probably brought a couple of billion people out of poverty and into the middle classes in, around the world in the last 30 years. So if we look at it from a global standpoint, there's no question inequality has not risen. It's only risen in the context of this American economy for the reasons you mentioned. Uh, there's an economist by the name of Angus Deaton who's written a nice little book on the, uh, the kind of growth of equality around the world because of this, this phenomenon. Uh, so we've had, we've had billions of people brought into the capitalist order to their, much to their benefit. But as you say, are wealthy can invest in stocks and so on. The other thing I'd say is that the, a lot of our people are invested in pension funds. Piketty and Sayez can't really take into account uh, the wealth that people have in pension funds. And of course, you know, people who retire depend very much on these returns to, to those investments. Okay, here. Yeah, well, I think that's probably true. I didn't haven't have gone into that, but many people have written about the sort of mating, the uh, women working, marrying other, uh, marrying men of their income class, doubling up their incomes, and so on. Yeah, I, that's undoubtedly a factor too. Is that bad? Obviously not. Uh, that's freedom. That's uh, participation in the workforce. That's liberation of women. That's those are things that we 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 want. So uh, certainly we're not going to reduce inequality by sending women back into the home. So, yeah. My other point is that I do think you're on to something with the credit market because if you look at, I mean, if you look at the trend of comparing the credit market to the GDP, they really start to separate, not, not, when, not in the 1980s when the tax yeah. rates come in that picketing point to in the 70s yeah. before any of those tax changes. Somewhere in the mid '70s, it looks like. Yeah. So I, I mean, I guess you keep going to the Bretton Woods. That would be the gold standard uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen. I mean, I don't read the economic literature, but I'm not sure that I've seen anyone study this particular phenomenon here. Uh, Perhaps one more thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, that's uh, certainly a point Piketty, Piketty makes, which is that we had this very high growth in the 50s and 60s with 91% marginal rates, yes. So I, I think that, that the rise of the stock market, in part, at least a good part, maybe, your point about the billions of people who have come into the economy, you know, and demography rules, and Europe was rebuilt essentially, at least mostly by 
suddenly had to compete with all these people that they never had to compete with before. Um, but educated people um, could make use of all those people. So their wages grew relatively faster than less educated people. Well, I think that's true, yes. I, uh, that dovetails a lot with what I've said. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's generally true. Globalization has helped our, our better off citizens and workers, but it's, the, it's hurt people in the middle. So what happens if globalization leads to permanent inequality? In, in the United States. Now, it's not leading to that worldwide, but it is leading to that in the United States. Right? Isn't that more or less what we're saying? Yeah. So we're talking about the in the American scene, yeah, right. Probably, probably not. Uh, that's a big challenge for America. Yeah, if we could grow faster, maybe that's not possible. Um, uh, you know, we might be able to ameliorate that to some degree. I don't think that we can solve that problem, though, by, uh, by uh, how to put it exactly, uh, by relying upon somehow on, on government borrowing money and using that money to sustain the living standards of as many people as possible. That is to say, uh, uh, you know, we have Social Security and we have all sorts of social programs that people lean on to sustain their lifestyles to some degree in this period when their incomes are stagnating. And, you know, how far along the road can we go with that? Because we're already deeply in debt. So, uh, yes, this is, a, this is a challenge for the United States. I think, but I think it's, we only get out of it by finding a way to grow. And one of the, one of the other big problems that we have is that we have a mature system of political economy. And by a mature system of political economy, I mean one that all the major interest groups are very well represented in government and have entrenched themselves around the national capital so that they can prevent anything from happening that might have an adverse effect on what they're doing. And that over that accumulating over a period of time in any country will slow down growth because the groups can, you know, veto anything that runs counter to their interest. Now, of course, we had a technological boom in Silicon Valley, but we have great potential uh, in the energy industry in the United States. Uh, but we face great obstacles in turning that loose. That's one source of potential growth in the United States that for a lot of reasons we may not be able to get to. But that's, that's another, another piece of the story. It's obviously a, a big question, and I've just given you a slice of it tonight. Thank you. Thanks again. That's great, Jim. Okay. Yeah.